Hi, welcome to our video on viruses. In order to really get a handle on what we're gonna talk about in this video, you definitely wanna make sure that you have a good understanding of how DNA functions in cells. If you don't, you probably wanna go back and watch those videos before you watch this one, or it might not make quite as much sense as it would otherwise. This is an image from the 1918 influenza pandemic, which was caused by the virus that you see in this electron micrograph above me, the flu virus, which is a pretty deadly virus in the number of people it kills each year. In 1918, that strain was particularly virulent and killed a lot more people than normal. So it seemed like a pretty obvious place to start when talking about viruses. The question we're gonna answer here is how do viruses function in biological systems? Viruses were first discovered by Martin Bjerink. At the end of the 1800s, he was doing experiments with plants and looking at a disease called mosaic disease. And he was trying to isolate the, the pathogen or the disease causing agent that caused mosaic disease. And it turned out to be smaller than any known organism at the time, which included things like bacteria. And this is because it's caused by a virus, the tobacco mosaic virus, which is uh, much, much, much smaller than even the smallest cells on the planet. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about uh, viral anatomy, what they look like, viral life cycles, which is in quotes for pretty obvious reasons, and how viruses function in evolution. And let's get it out of the way first. Are viruses alive? Are they not? We can make a case in both directions. A lot of biologists would say that they're absolutely not alive because they need to infect cells in order to carry out their their life cycle, I guess we could call it, or their cycle of existence is probably better in that case. They don't have any external metabolism other than when they're actively infecting cells. They're more like particles in that sense. Other biologists will say they absolutely are alive because they have genetic material and they evolve just like other life and so on. They're just non-cellular life. I'm going to say that this is a dumb argument to engage in because it doesn't matter whether they're alive or not has no bearing upon anything, particularly the viruses who genuinely don't care what you call them. They just are. So let's leave that argument aside. I will probably refer to them in terms of their life cycles and so on going forward. That's totally fine. Don't get pedantic on me here. It's really not the point. So let's go in and let's take a look at viral anatomy. I've got two different viruses here. We have uh, the tobacco mosaic virus and bacteriophage T4. I just went with these two because they're just very, very different. There's two different parts to a virus. There's some nucleic acid and there is a protein coat. The protein coat surrounds the nucleic acid. The nucleic acid could be DNA, but it doesn't actually have to be DNA. And that's really our first big difference with viruses, that viruses have a huge diversity of genomes. They can be double-stranded or single-stranded. They can be DNA or RNA. They can be the template strand of the RNA, they can be the coding strand of the RNA. There's just a huge variety of diversity in viral genomes that we do not see in cellular life, which all have DNA-based genomes. When we consider how viruses live, let's pick one sort of the classic example. We'll look at lytic phages. These are viruses that affect bacterial cells and inject their genetic information into the bacterial cell and take over the bacterial cell for the purpose of making more viruses. This is kind of like the classic life cycle that most people think about when they think about how viruses work. The bacteriophage will attach to the host cell. It will inject its DNA. The DNA will code for proteins that will basically destroy the host genome and lead to the production of more copies of the viral genome and the various coat proteins. They'll then assemble inside of the cell and then the cell will explode and release all of the viral particles into the surrounding environment where they'll go and infect more bacterial cells. This is definitely the simplest of the viral life cycles. There are more complex ones. So to take an example, these are other bacterial viruses known as lysogenic phages. These phages will inject their DNA and instead of then just destroying the host cell genome, that DNA will incorporate itself into the host cell's chromosome so that as the host cell divides, the viral genome is copied and divides with it. When environmental cues are right, the viral genome will then excise from the host cell genome and then will trigger sort of the typical massive production of phages and release of phages into the environment. So it's a little bit more complicated than the lytic cycle, but still pretty easy to get our head around. Phages, of course, are bacterial viruses. 
animal viruses and eukaryotic cell viruses can be much more complex than that. A great example to look at for this is HIV, which I'm sure you're aware of. It's a virus that can cause acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS. Over on the left of this graphic are HIV particles infecting, our HIV virions infecting a helper T cell, which is the population of cells in the human body that they infect. And then we have a cartoon graphic of the HIV particle itself. Looking at the HIV particles anatomy, we've got receptor proteins on the surface that help it connect to the cell and invade the cell. We've also got a lipid envelope, which is pretty typical in animal cell viruses. This is actually a modified phospholipid bilayer that the HIV particle gets from the cell that it had previously infected. And we've got the RNA genome inside of the cell. HIV has an RNA genome as well as, well as some additional enzymes that are packaged into the viral particle that help HIV carry out its viral life cycle. Here's the viral life cycle of HIV, and we'll look at each step in turn. HIV is going to infect its helper T cell host. It's going to be incorporated into the cell, and then the envelope is going to be removed from it. This is going to expose the viral RNA genome, which is then going to be turned into a DNA genome, which you can see happening down at the bottom left of the picture through a process called reverse transcription. That DNA genome is then going to be integrated into the host cell's genome, and that is then going to be used to produce new viral particles that the infected T cell is going to release rather than sort of in a big explosion of viral particles, more like one at a time over the rest of this infected helper T cell's life until such time as that cell dies. Each of those HIV particles will then go on and infect other cells. The, the really interesting part about the HIV life cycle that we're going to focus on, you probably already noticed, but it's, it's the part on the bottom left of this diagram. It's the reverse transcription stage. Let's look at that more in depth. We know that generally speaking, DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into protein. This is generally how all biological information flows. Reverse transcriptase is doing something fundamentally different. It's taking the RNA genome of the HIV virus and turning it back into a DNA copy. This is going exactly opposite of any other way that we've ever really investigated the flow of biological information. And it really only happens here in this group of viruses, which are known as retroviruses. It's a fundamentally unique thing, but it gets at, an, it gets at a larger point, which is that viruses do all sorts of interesting things that other biological systems just don't do. And they're able to do this one because these viruses have an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, whose entire job is to take an RNA molecule and turn it back into a DNA molecule. And you can see that happening in this image here with the RNA in green and the DNA molecule in blue. Another really interesting thing about viruses is how quickly they can evolve. So these are the two surface proteins on the influenza virus, uh, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, both are used during the influenza virus life cycle. As a matter of fact, we characterize the different types of influenza viruses that we find in the environment based on the types of these proteins that they have. Designations like H1N1 or H7N9 refer to the type of hemagglutinin and the type of neuraminidase that th that particular strain of virus has. And there's a wide variety of these proteins because viruses evolve so quickly. Viruses reproduce very, very rapidly, and the polymerases that they use are prone to much higher rates of error during replication than cellular polymerases are. The result of this is that viruses have very, very high mutation rates, which means that they can evolve comparatively rapidly when we consider them against things like cellular systems. This is why you need to get a flu shot every year, assuming you get a flu shot, and you really should. The flu is not a good thing to get. Because of the rapid evolution of the influenza viral genome, the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase protein are constantly shifting their types. Different flu strains will become more or less dominant from year to year. And even though your immune system may have been exposed to one strain over the course of your life, that doesn't mean that if you're infected by a different strain in a subsequent year, that your immune system can still mount an effective response against that strain. Antibodies that your immune system makes, like those shown here in beige and red, to the different viral proteins of the flu virus may no longer interact with those proteins if those proteins mutate so much that their shape changes to the, to the point where the antibody no longer fits to that protein. Viruses can also do interesting things like recombine their genomes. If two different strains simultaneously co-infect the same cell, they'll start to exchange or recombine their genetic material so that the viral offspring that that cell produces has a combination of the genetics from both of the infecting strains. 
And of course, we should also note that viruses do play a role in the bacterial world in terms of moving genetic material from one cell to the next. During transduction, a phage can get packaged with genetic material that isn't the viral genome, but could be a remnant of the chromosome from the cell that it invaded, so that when it's released and it infects the next cell, it could transfer that genetic material and therefore increase the variation in the bacterial population through this mechanism of horizontal gene transfer. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of viruses. Make sure you can do these things here at the end. Make sure you can describe the major parts of a generalized virus. Make sure you can compare and contrast viruses with cellular life forms. Make sure that you can diagram and explain the major features of a viral life cycle. Make sure that you can explain what happens during retroviral infection of a cell. And finally, make sure you can explain why viruses evolve rapidly. If you can do each of those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions you have so that you can get the information that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.